So tonight we're discussing fertility treatment for single people who should pay. It includes questions such as if the state were to fund this, then what if any access criteria should be put in place? Should the access criteria be the same as for heterosexual couples, same-sex couples? Um, if we want to improve equality in access to fertility treatment, can we do this without introducing new inequities? Because, you know, we want to do something good, not create a whole load more problems down the track. Now, to tackle these issues, we've got a fantastic lineup for you this evening. We have Sarah Martins de Silva, Alan Brown, Catherine Jones, and Guido Pennings. So, our first speaker this evening is Dr. Sarah Martins de Silva. Sarah is the clinical lead for fertility services at NHS Tayside and a consultant um, obstetrician and gynaecologist at Ninewell Hospital's Assisted Conception Unit. She's also clinical reader in reproductive medicine at the University of Dundee and much more. So this is the question and, uh, that we're going to try and tackle this evening. And as Sarah says, I'm a clinical reader in reproductive medicine, which means that I do research with the University of Dundee. But I'm also a consultant gynaecologist at Ninewell's Assisted Conception Unit. And I'm very proud to be part of an organisation, the NHS, that provides healthcare free at the point of care. And the care that is provided is impartial and non-judgmental. So if you are a lifelong smoker and you develop lung cancer and require surgery to resect that, then the NHS will do that for you at the cost of about eight and a half thousand pounds. If you are overweight, unfit, hypertensive, and develop chest pain and unstable angina and need a stent for your heart, then the NHS will do that for nine and a half thousand pounds. If you're unfortunate enough to slip over on the uh, cobbles of Edinburgh in the ice and snow and break your ankle that requires surgical fixation, then uh, you can have that done by the NHS for somewhere between four and a half and eight and a half thousand pounds. But I think the point I'm trying to make here is that I think the NHS is not really valued by any of us, and I think even the clinicians that work within the NHS don't truly understand the cost required to deliver healthcare. Now, the second part of NHS healthcare or healthcare delivery is the fact that across the UK it is evidence based delivery of treatments and interventions. And what that means really is that the evidence that's there is synthesised by a number of different uh, organisations, but uh, one that springs to mind is the NICE, so the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. And what they do is they look at all the evidence that guides then how we deliver treatment, what treatments are used and they look at how the best treatments work, but also the cost effectiveness for that. And in fertility treatment, that's slightly different because access is apparently restricted much more obviously in any other form of, of, of delivery of healthcare. Some of those eligibility criteria that we work within are informed by NICE, and uh, you will be well aware of, of, of the reasons behind that, but mainly because we want to deliver effective fertility treatment uh, and, and cost-effective fertility treatment. So if you are a, a couple and your female partner is under the age of 40, NICE guidelines would say that you need three cycles or up to three cycles of IVF. If you're between 41 and 43 years of age, then you can have one cycle of NHS-funded treatment. <clears throat> And there are other access criteria. Both partners need to be non-smokers, no methadone, no illicit drugs. Uh, if you have been through a series of investigations and no apparent cause for your infertility, then the recommendation is to be trying for a pregnancy for two years before moving on to IVF that would be funded. A female has to have a reasonably healthy BMI between 18 and a half and 30. And these really are influenced these, these choice of criteria are influenced by whether treatment will work, but also about the desire for a healthy pregnancy and a, a healthy mum and baby at the end of that. But if you've had a child already, if you, between you, are, are, are biological parents or legal parents as a couple, then there is no treatment for you on the NHS. <clears throat> I think it is really important to deliver fertility treatment. I think you would expect me as a clinician working in this sector that I'm going to believe and, and thoroughly believe in what I do. It is part of our fundamental human right to be able to assist couples and individuals to, fund a to found a family. 
But there's also a great appreciation of the huge and wide-reaching effects of infertility. It's a very challenging condition that has both psychological and physical uh, effects. And in a recent Fertility Network UK survey, uh, asking couples that were going through treatment and experiencing infertility, up to 83% of them said they felt sad, frustrated or worried often or all of the time. Nearly half of them experienced depression, and one in 10 experienced suicidal feelings, often or all the time. These are horrific experiences that our couples go through. And we are, those of us that work within the fertility sector, also aware of the collateral damage that infertility causes on, on stress, on strain, on relationships, on finances, on career progression, as well as the global impact and social consequences for women who are unable to bear children. The issue, the first issue I want to highlight then is, although in Scotland we are very lucky, we are funded well and we follow the NICE guidelines, that is not the experience of couples across the UK. There are many people in England and Wales and beyond where they do not get the three cycles that the NICE guidelines would suggest that they should access. And I think one of my real challenges here about our, you know, extending and, and, and looking at who's going to fund treatment for single people is, well, hang on a second, there's a whole heap of couples that aren't even getting the treatment that they need and deserve. But the reality is, if you are single, there is no NHS funding for the moment. And these are the costs that you might expect to encounter from our local private facility uh, clinic. So for a cycle of donor insemination, you're looking at something like £2,500, IVF using donor sperm, upwards of £7,000, donor eggs anywhere between six and a half to over £9,500, and surrogacy prices on inquiry only. So there's a big question here, isn't it, that we're trying to address of who should pay, and as logistically, simplistically, that comes down to, is the NHS going to fund this? or are we going to expect single people to pay for their own treatment? And one of the questions I guess that I'm really struggling is, well, why on earth is fertility treatment for a single person any different to treating a couple? There's many couples of all kinds of arrangements, might need donor gametes and so on, we treat them. Why on earth wouldn't you treat a single person? And then there's a part of me that sort of stands back from this and saying, well, we're a national health service. And actually, is being single a medical condition? I don't know whether I've got the answers, but anyway, let's carry on. So there's, there's some fundamental biology here, clearly. If you are a, 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 a wanting a baby, then we need an egg, and we need some sperm, or a sperm, to create an embryo that then needs to be placed within a uterus, and that person then carries the pregnancy to deliver, a, a, hopefully, a live baby. So fundamentally, if you're an individual, a single person that produces eggs, then you're going to need donor sperm for that equation, uh, assuming you have a uterus. And if you're a single person producing sperm, then you're going to need donor eggs, as well as a surrogate to carry that pregnancy. And I guess surrogacy is a quite complicated topic in and of its own right. But thinking then about, well, OK, look, it's relatively simple. Why don't we just focus on treating single women? That would be a place to start. <laughs> appreciate what Sarah is saying about inequalities, but actually there's a slightly more difficult problem here in that even the Scottish Government, the politicians, the uh, police can't quite decide in Scotland what is a woman. Uh, you see the picture of Isla Bryson there and the uh, prison stories that came out earlier this year. But we live in an increasingly diverse and, and exciting community where people may identify from a, a different sex to the, that, that the biological uh, gamete or, or whatever that they bring to the equation and that makes this much much more complicated but there's also a much bigger thing about why would you treat one sex and not the other you know that's fundamentally wrong in my mind so you need donor gametes or donor egg or donor sperm to make a baby if you're going to treat somebody that's single donor recruitment requires amazing people that are prepared to donate their eggs or their sperm but it also requires a huge and phenomenal amount of investment, clinical investment. It requires multiple appointments and a significant investment of time and energy. From an initial kind of health questionnaire return, you need to have somebody that has a good ovarian reserve, a nice quantity of eggs, or has got good sperm, better than normal sperm, that can freeze and thaw well. 
There are also various genetics tests that need to be completed and other infectious diseases screening. And all of these tests are time sensitive and need to be repeated at intervals. So there's a huge amount of investment that needs to happen to recruit donors. And there's less than at the end of that pathway uh, three to four out of a hundred potential donors would be recruited um, f f following that pathway. So there's a significant issue with donor supply and demand. Our eligible patients are already poorly su supplied and, and, and therefore we need either significant additional NHS investment or money to import donor eggs and sperm from elsewhere. So then lastly then, what is infertility? And there's some definitions that I've put up on the slide here, one from the WHO and one from the NHS, both of which have a nod to the fact that to be diagnosed with infertility is a medical condition, there's a couple trying for a pregnancy. More recently, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine has released this committee opinion, which I think probably is much more in keeping with today's world. And what they say here is that intervention should be not limited to the use of donor egg, sperm, or embryos. So lastly, demand for fertility services are potentially limited, but our NHS resources are not. We already have a waiting time. We have complaints about how long people wait for treatment, and people who need donor eggs or sperm already wait a long time. So we hugely need more investment for donor programs and so on. But just because something's difficult or needs money, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. The NHS should be accessible to all. Young single people have a really good prognosis for fertility, and we shouldn't be excluding them by calling them single and not treating them. Our next speaker this evening is Dr Alan Brown. Alan is a senior lecturer in private law at the University of Glasgow School of Law. He's author of the book, What is the Family of Law? The Influence of the Nuclear Family. I'm not actually convinced that this is a problem where the law itself offers us many answers and many solutions. Um, and so I want to explain why I think that is. Uh, why, why I think that while this is an interesting question and while there are, of course, legal dimensions to it, it might be one where law is not the answer. Okay, so... The first thing I want to talk about is the legislative framework for fertility treatment in the UK and how that relates to the question of funded NHS fertility treatment for single people and I suppose actually how, how it doesn't relate to the, to the funding really is, is my point. So just a very sort of basic, um, boring <laughs> legal point Human Fertilisation and Embryology Act 1990 was the, 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 the starting point for our legislation of fertility treatment that was updated by the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Act 2008. But the 1990 Act still remains and, and much of the, the fertility landscape is still regulated by the 1990 Act. Both of these pieces of legislation are UK wide. So they apply to Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. However, healthcare is devolved. So the NHS is devolved to each of the legislatures, the parliaments, the assemblies, at least when the Northern Ireland one is sitting, uh, in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. As well as that, in England, the NHS is structured in such a way that decisions about health treatment are devolved in a further way to local trusts. Um, so we have a, a framework here where we have a legislative framework about fertility, but we also have a sort of range of devolved frameworks for healthcare. Okay, what that means obviously is that there are differences between how the NHS operates in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England and within different regions in England and that is obviously true regardless of what sort of medical treatment we are talking about. There are, there are differences not in the context of fertility, there are differences in any context and we accept this within the legal framework that regulates the NHS. This is just a, a basic a part of, of how our health service works. So, the statutory framework relating to fertility allows fertility treatment for single people, both single women and uh, single men in the case of surrogacy. So, there's no prohibition in the human fertilization embryology legislation on single people accessing treatment. Uh, this is especially true since the 2008 Act changed some of the statutory language. So the 1990 Act contained a condition 
um, that when um, clinics with licenses in the UK were considering treatment, they needed to consider the need of uh, that child for a father. So there was a provision that explicitly said that, that was interpreted by some as um, calling into question whether single women would actually, in every case, be allowed to access treatment. However, that was removed by the 2008 Act. What the, the Act now refers to is the need for the child to have supportive parenting. So there's no, there's no legal prohibition there. However, there's no distinction in this legislation between public and private treatment. What the human fertilization and embryology legislation is concerned with is what sorts of treatment can licensed fertility clinics in the UK provide? That's it. The fertility regulator, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, also does not have any regulatory powers in relation to the funding of treatment. The funding of treatment is a question for the NHS. It's a question for the health boards, or in, in the case of Scotland or Wales, the, the national, in that sense, health service. So, as uh, Sarah said in her talk before, there are differences in, in how fertility treatment is accessed across the UK. Okay, so it's accepted within law uh, that decisions made by health boards are subject to judicial review. So, there is the possibility for individuals to challenge these decisions about funding. Um, and You'll notice that my title on the first side said private law. So I am talking about judicial review here, which is public law. So if I get anything wrong, I apologize to the public lawyers. But broadly speaking, in a judicial review, you would challenge a decision on the ground that it was irrational, illegal, or that it violated certain aspects of the human rights regime. Um, it's very, very difficult in this context, I think, to envisage a situation in which a court would believe a decision of a health board was irrational, given that these decisions are based on um, documentation relating to clinical criteria that will be um, set out and referred to. Uh, there, I don't think there's any illegality challenge because there's an established legal regime, which means I think that the, the context where we might have some legal involvement is on the human rights grounds. So that is what I want to talk about now. I want to talk about the, uh, whether the human rights regime offers a potential solution to the lack of access to funded treatment. So, it's been understood by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg that the European Convention on Human Rights contains a right to reproductive autonomy. And that comes from a combination of Article 8, which is the right to private and family life, Article 12, which is the right to marry and found a family, and Article 14, which is the right not to be discriminated against in the exercise of your other rights under the Convention. But this does not necessarily include any positive obligation on contract contracting states to the ECHR. So in, in the uh, human rights context, in the European human rights context, I should say, there are positive obligations and there are negative obligations. Negative obligations are states' obligations not to interfere with people's rights. Positive obligations are states have to do certain things to give effect to rights. So in the context of reproductive autonomy, what there is is an obligation on states not to interfere with reproductive autonomy. So you can see here how if a state had a prohibition on single people accessing treatment, the ECHR would be a way in which we could challenge that. But if single people can access treatment, but not get it paid for by the state, it's not necessarily clear that that is an infringement of the negative uh, right. And indeed, there's never been any cases about this specific context, but what there have been is uh, some cases in the round where the ECHR have heard challenges in relation to the distribution of state resources and public expenditure. And the court in Strasbourg has been very, very reluctant to engage with those sorts of questions. Seeing them as falling within what the European Court called the margin of appreciation, which is the margin that it gives the state authorities to make its own decisions. And indeed, I think that the distribution of resources is often seen by the courts as a political matter, as not necessarily something that is their um, domain. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would never intervene 
in this sort of context. So, what then might be the potential human rights claims? I think, and for lack of time, I'm just going to focus on what I think would be the, the, the most likely human rights claim, and that would be one about discrimination. So, Article 14 of the European Convention, which provides, quote, the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in the Convention shall be secured without discrimination, and then it lists a bunch of grounds on which uh, discrimination isn't prohibit, is prohibited, and then it says, or other status. Okay, so there are three questions here about whether this would amount to uh, discrimination. The first is, would the court hold that um, this is actually something that satisfies the first part of Article 14, uh, the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in the Convention? So the European Court might simply say, actually, the question of funding doesn't relate to a right or freedom in the Convention, for the reasons I set out in relation to positive and negative obligations. They might, they might not. It's never been argued, so I'm not clear on whether it would meet that ground. Then, presuming that they did say that Article 14 was engaged, the next question then is, is any discrimination justified? Because discrimination can be justified on, on various grounds under the Convention. And this is what in uh, the jurisprudence of the European Court is called proportionality. So it'd be a proportionality question. And again, going back to the point about the distribution of resources, it's not at all clear to me that a court would feel that this was something where they could step in on human rights grounds. And just finally, one other point that I want to make about this is that there are arguments around human rights that come from um, the UN conventions, what we call um, the economic and social rights and things like that, where there are rights to health. But those at the moment are not, um, they've not been incorporated into domestic law in the UK, which means they're what we call soft law rather than hard law. They're not something that you could go before a court and argue. So they might influence the government in, in, in when it's passing legislation, but they're not things that the court could challenge on. All of this is then to conclude and say that, as I said at the beginning, I'm not entirely convinced that law offers us an answer to this restriction. Our next speaker this evening is Dr Catherine Jones. Catherine is a lecturer at King's College London's Social, Genetic and Developmental uh, Psychiatry Centre. And Catherine is the author of research into people who are single parents by choice, who are single fathers via egdonation and surrogacy, and who are donor conceived and have single mothers. So I'll be speaking not to exactly the question at hand, but instead to describe some research, psychological research, on parents who do go fertility treatment as a single parent um, and what it's like for them, for their family, and for their children. So to give a brief overview of what I'll be discussing today, I'll be talking about two studies conducted at the Centre for Family Research at the University of Cambridge, and, and the studies are led by Professor Susan Gollenbock. And these studies explore parent and child adjustment and um, experiences and perspectives in single mother and single father families who've used assisted reproduction to start their family. And the families um, reflect families formed under different regulations, such as before and after the 2000 and change in donor anonymity, and also the very recent changes in the last five or six years about parental order laws. And before this research was carried out by Professor Gollenbach, very little was known about parenting, parental mental health, and child adjustment in these families. So to begin with, the first study is a longitudinal study of solo mothers, and the term solo mothers is used interchangeably in the research with single mothers by choice. So someone who actively decides to start a family alone, um, most often through using fertility treatment. And this study was the first comparative study of heterosexual single mothers and heterosexual coupled mothers with children aged four years and above. Um, so at this age onwards, then the children might start to understand a little bit about what it means to be in a single parent home and to be donor conceived. So it offers um, an opportunity to study children as well in their perspectives rather than um, just the parent perspectives when children are in infancy. And both family types use sperm donation and the study was in-depth, multi-method and multi-informant. So when families were first recruited, roughly equal numbers of single mothers and coupled mothers were recruited with children who are aged four to nine years old. And about two thirds of the single mothers and most of the couple mothers had used an identifiable donor. 
and they were recruited via the London Women's Clinic, but ended up living all over the UK, including in Scotland. And the families were matched, so kind of no differences in child age or child gender, the mother's education or perceived financial difficulties, and many of the mothers were in professional occupations. At the second phase, then, um, about 80% of the families took part again. Slightly more single mums than coupled mums took part of this phase, and the children were in middle childhood into their sort of early teenage years. In terms of the methods, then um, semi-structured interviews were conducted with the parent, with the mother, um, about their quality of parenting, and um, also interviews were conducted with the children at both phases. And at the second phase, they're able to kind of answer a few more questions, and we did an attachment-based interview with them, the friends and family interview as well. And standardised questions were completed by um, the mothers and also by the teacher. So the strength and difficulties questionnaire looks at child adjustments to gain a sort of independent perspective. Um, and we observed the mother and child playing together, doing a task together. And also psychiatrists rated um, part of the mother's interview, which is about child development. In terms of family functioning, um, then at both phases, then there weren't any differences between the single mother and coupled mother families in terms of the mother's mental health or quality of parenting or parent-child interaction and also child adjustment. And across both family types, what was found to matter for child adjustment was factors that we find across many different studies of child adjustment. So perceived financial difficulties and parenting stress are what sort of matters in terms of predicting child emotional and behavioral difficulties rather than anything to do with family type. In terms of the children's own perspectives, um, at phase one, when the children were quite young, we had to use some different methods in order to interview them in order to kind of elucidate their narratives at this early age. And so one of the methods, you can see a picture there, the children are asked to draw themselves in the middle of a circle and draw people who they think are close to them in the closer circles and less close further away and um, asked to explain who are these family members. And so 47 children took part and when asked to describe their family, two of them included the donor and one included donor siblings. Like in that picture, you can see the donor is represented in black and the rest of the family are in red. And only one child reported having been teased because of their family type. And at this age, the children were more focused on the idea of father absence than the donor in discussions with their mother, suggesting some sort of social context influencing the children's own perspectives of family life. At the second phase, when they were a little bit older, we had a more in-depth interview with them. Um, gained a more in-depth perspective of what the children felt about the donor and also they're able to describe the process of donor conception and um, how their family was start started at this phase. Um, there are different conceptualizations of the donor reported by the children um, which were categorized as either positive, negative or neutral and positive was the most common so my child said he's probably quite a kind person, the sort of person who wants to help people and um, quite a contrast to one of the negative descriptions which is he's just a weird man who helped make babies, that's it. So the children were able to describe their own feelings at this age um, and the rest of them described quite neutral terms. In terms of the attachment findings, then more positive mother-child relationship quality was associated with more positive perceptions of the donor, and more negative mother-child relationship quality um, conceptualized through disorganized attachment was associated with more negative perceptions of the donor. So showing how family functioning um, appeared to relate to how children felt about the donor, but it would be important to do more longitudinal research to see how the children view the donor into their adolescence and early, early adulthood. So now to briefly describe the second study. Um, the study was international and it looked at solo fathers and explored 21 solo fathers who'd used surrogacy and egg donation to start their family. And the fathers described their sexuality as mostly, mostly fathers identified as gay, one as heterosexual and one as asexual. And the research started in 2018, so it kind of covered the change in the UK law about parental orders for single people um, after this, which we expect much more many more people to um, start accessing surrogacy um, as single fathers in the UK. Now it's um, a little bit more easy for them. So there's a separate surrogate and egg donor, and the most common location was the US for surrogacy. 
However, there is striking variation in terms of the father's experiences based in terms of the costs and the experiences they had. Um, and in some countries, fathers are unable to access surrogacy. And surrogacy is banned in actually many countries across Europe. So this created quite a diversity in where the fathers could access it and what it was like for them. In terms of methods, then similar methods were chosen to the solo mother sample in order to allow for a comparison between the two samples, so semi-structured interviews with the father, looking at attachment and parenting, and also standardized questionnaires. And the children were much younger in this sample, um, so weren't kind of able to do the same measures as the children in the solo mother sample, um, but it would be useful to, to be able to follow them up at a slightly later stage. So a subsample of the solo mother's sample was compared with the father's, and no differences were found regarding depression, anxiety, or parenting stress, and the fathers um, were generally um, very happy. And both um, families reported very supportive networks that they had purposely kind of fostered and reached out to, um, both in the journey to becoming a single parent, but also once they had become a single parent. And because single fathers are kind of a minority family type, um, we we're interested in finding out um, how they felt the public perceived them and, and reactions they had to their family type. They felt that you know, they often received quite positive reactions, yet also experienced responses reinforcing some normative depictions of family and family life. And as very little research has explored single fathers' experiences of egg donation and surrogacy in order to start a family, we wanted to explore this in a little bit more detail um, and found through the narratives that a few key themes um, emerged. So firstly, the fathers thought this is a really important opportunity to start a family um, that they wouldn't have had otherwise, particularly because um, in some countries they were unable to adopt as a single parent. So found it... Um, really important to be able to have this choice to start their family. Yet yeah, they faced um, a number of challenges and constraints, um, particularly legal ones, but also financial ones. Um, and many of them reported that the surrogate had um, a special relationship in their life um, and that they had continued um, being in contact with the surrogate and sometimes described the surrogate as a friend or sometimes as, for example, a godmother. So, to summarise this, um, then the research offers a novel insight into the lives of solo parents who use assisted reproduction and the parents and children are doing well. But there are barriers to accessing treatment, those already described today and also described by the participants in the study, so only a small number of people are able to make this choice. Um, so really there should be equal access to fertility treatment not just regardless of relationship status, but also regardless of gender, regardless of sexuality, everybody should have equal access to be able to start a family. Finally, to conclude the presentations, we have Professor Guido Pennings. Guido is Emeritus Professor of Ethics and Bioethics at Ghent University, and he's director of the Bioethics Institute, Ghent. Guido is chair of uh, Belgium's Federal Commission for Medical and Scientific Research uh, on embryos in vitro. I'm here to provide a bit more of an international perspective on the, on the issue. Um, and I have two examples, uh, both my own country, Belgium and France. And just to give you an idea about the numbers, so these are the latest numbers that we have available. And this is on uh, cycles with donor sperm. And as you can see, these are 2019 and 2020. Approximately one in three of all recipients are single women. And so the other third, a uh, bit more, are lesbian couples. And as you can also see is that, in fact, the number of heterosexual couples is around 10%. So over the years, they have almost, not entirely, but almost completely disappeared. And the numbers you see here, you have to be careful because they also include French couples. So it's just donor treatment regardless of the nationality of the persons that are uh, having the treatment. France, as you might know, they have changed their legislation in 2021 where they allowed uh, single and lesbian couples access to infertility treatment. They didn't uh, before. Um, the uh, about a year ago, they had around 5,600 persons on the waiting list for donor sperm, of which, again, 36% lesbian couples 
and 38% single women. Now, one of the problems for France, since they are not allowed to import sperm, is that the mean waiting time now at that time was already around 14 months and is probably going to increase in the coming years. We'll see what is going to happen uh, this year. Now, I'm going to give, if you want, a kind of ethical version of what Alan was already talking about. Um, an important thing when you look at uh, the ethics of uh, reimbursement in healthcare, the first idea is that every country has to decide whether or not to include infertility treatment into the basic healthcare package. So it's up to the country to do that. But the idea obviously is that everything that you put into the basic healthcare package should be accessible for all, regardless of the financial means of the person. Now obviously, I've also been working on IVF in developing countries, poor countries can with a very good reason, say that they are not going to include infertility treatment because survival is more important than procreation. So, but anyway, you have the idea that the states are free to decide whether or not to reimburse. However, from a moral point of view, there's another basic rule that says that if a state reimburses infertility treatment for some groups, like for instance heterosexual couples, it should also reimburse treatment for other groups unless relevant differences can be demonstrated. If you cannot demonstrate relevant differences, it means that you discriminate in the uh, ethical sense of the term. And so the relevance here refers to a number of different issues. So normally these are morally relevant criteria that you use to decide whether or not someone should have access and it might be, for instance, the welfare of the child, the health of the woman, or also cost effectiveness. Now, we are focusing here mainly on the um, financial barriers, but I would like to point at another kind of barrier that is uh, especially in Belgium, according to me, one of the basic problems. If you look at what is happening in practice, then you will see that every clinic uses its own criteria to decide who gets access to treatment. And probably within each clinic, every counselor also has her own criteria to decide who gets access. And it does not necessarily mean that there's some kind of uniform uh, um, uh, list that is being used. Now also important is to realize that if you look at how the Belgian system works, the primary uh, role of the counselor, psychologist, doctor at the first appointment is gatekeeping, meaning that they are there to screen to see whether the person is fit to have a child. Now, I give you here the data, it's unpublished data. I had hoped that they would be published in the meantime, but it's still not the case. But so this is a clinic that looked at uh, all the initial requests that were um, made by single women at their center. In one year, so 2019, 688 requests were sent for information. Yeah, you can see that exactly half of these women did not even send back the questionnaire. Now it turned out that this is a four page questionnaire with all kinds of very detailed questions about all kinds of different things in the present and the past of women. So you can guess that probably they have self-selected themselves out. So because they might have realized that this is not going to work for them. And of the remaining 344, almost one in four are rejected. Now this is compared to the other groups, heterosexual couples and lesbian couples, incredibly high. So there's, there's barely 5%, I think, that will be rejected in the other two groups. So why is this? Now, if you then look at the list, it is quite amazing what kind of criteria are included. So the single woman should be at least 25 years old, in some cases even 28 years old, before she can get an insemination. She should not live with her parents. She should have had long-term sexual relationships in the past. She should not see her child as the only means of giving meaning to her life. She should have a job or a stable income. 
an extended social network, not have a serious men physical handicap, not be mentally retarded, and not ha have a life-threatening disease. Now, if you look at all this, you can start wondering whether all these criteria can be considered relevant. Because what exactly is the idea behind these criteria? And of course, if you list them, and by the way, this is not an exhaustive list, then you can fairly easily explain why so many of them drop out or are in fact uh, being rejected. So there seems to be an ideological component that is playing on many different aspects of the screening process. Now, we talked about payment. Now, I, I was a bit surprised, but I, I uh, had a discussion just before this meeting. I looked at the HFEA data, and there you can see, so this is a publication of 2022, only 8% of the donor insemination treatments for single women and women in same-sex relationships were publicly funded between 2016 and 2020. That is incredibly low. By the way, in Belgium, everyone who gets into the system gets reimbursed, 100%. So whether it's for IVF or for uh, insemination, it does not matter. And it does not matter whether you're treating in a private clinic or in a public hospital. Everyone gets exactly the same amount of reimbursement. But one of the important aspects that we see that is that people who are struggling to get through the financial barrier are in fact looking for a solution elsewhere. And there's the very recent publication by Taylor where you can see that a lot of these single women and lesbian couples are looking for a donor online with all the risks, disadvantages, and so on that are following from there. So if only for that reason, it looks as if you have a very good reason to start reimbursing so that at least that these women can have access within the regulated system and do not have to go elsewhere. Now, strangely enough, if you look again at Belgium, we have also a problem for the simple reason that although your treatment is being covered, your sperm samples are not covered. And if you have to pay for the sperm samples yourself, you may realize that this is also going to be quite a heavy total cost, especially, by the way, since Belgium has about a 10% success rate, which, according to everyone, is quite low. So, but then you realize that you have to buy quite a lot of sperm before you might get pregnant. And if people do not have to pay for blood and for organs, then why do they have to pay for sperm and eggs? So if the system would apply the same reasons, it should go there. Now, the talk has been, the previous talk has been mentioning single men. Most of the time, they're completely out of the picture. No one talks about them. It's, it's pretty amazing because obviously we say that there are very few of them. But of course, if you know beforehand that you're never going to get accepted, then obviously you're not going to present yourself. So how do we know how many of them are there? So, to conclude, certain groups may have legal theoretical access to infertility treatment, but encounter all kinds of obstacles in practice. In countries that reimburse infertility treatment, there is no justification for excluding single people. And I think that criteria for access should be specified to avoid unjust discrimination on the basis of prejudices, ideological assumptions, and so on. Just picking up on something that Guido said about IUI and a 10% success rate with IUI, Sarah, is that what you'd expect, a 10%? It seemed quite low to me. 10 to 15%, I think it's reasonable. So how much sperm would you think then, then potentially then that in the Belgian system where you have to buy your own? Someone would be buying. So I guess if the conversation that I would have with a couple, and I'm very cognizant of the fact there's a lot of clinicians here in the audience, but would be when we're talking about paying for treatment is that there's a calculation that you might need to anticipate three cycles of treatment to have about an equitable success to a cycle of IVF. And actually the costs there are fairly equal in terms of the donor sperm, if you're buying it, is expensive per unit and you need one unit per IUI treatment cycle versus the cost of IVF, which is more, but obviously you then only need one straw of IVF, uh, so, uh, donor sperm. 
Thank you very much, panel, for a, a really good uh, discussion. I'm Adam Balin from Leeds. I'm a gynecologist. None of you spoke against paying, uh, or the state paying for single women. I think in the UK we've got ourselves in a real muddle with funding, um, as I think we will all agree. And I would suggest that uh, we should open up funding for everybody um, in an equitable basis. Um, it's kind of bizarre in West Yorkshire where I've been on the funding panel and pushed very strongly for the funding of lesbian women. They now have the ability to have six cycles of IUI plus one cycle of IVF funded by the NHS, whereas heterosexual couples only get one cycle of IVF. So we're in a real muddle. And given that the overwhelming evidence is that these children are wanted, cared for, and have excellent outcomes, um, probably better than in other circumstances of conception, um, I, I think we need to take a step back and we need to open the doors for everybody. We need to stop getting ourselves in a muddle about all of this and recognise that these children are wanted and contribute more to society economically than the cost of the treatment themselves. And just one last point on Sarah, you were talking about the NHS cost of various treatments, whether it's for lung, treatment of lung cancer or a broken hip. When it comes to assisted conception, the costs that we talk about are generally the costs that are charged through private clinics. I work in a private clinic, so, you know, declaration of interest, but um, when we looked at NHS tariffs, of course, they're much lower. So, so fertility treatment doesn't necessarily need to cost that much. I think at the moment what we have is single people cannot access NHS funded fertility treatment. And by definition, therefore, those that do have fertility treatment have the financial wherewithal and the support and so on to be able to do that. So I guess one of my guarded concerns is if this is open to anybody, then do we see a different pattern of childhood experience, deprivation and so on, where there isn't that construct around it. You know, even as a couple, we all appreciate that looking after children, bringing up children, you know, you need a support network and so on. And that's my big fear, maybe unfounded, but I think the evidence that we have just doesn't explore all of what we have within the UK in terms of childhood experience. There's a huge amount of poverty in Dundee and so on, and I worry that actually we may be creating problems for these children rather than the, you know, the affluent, so desired child that you describe so eloquently. It's true that the studies um, often do find that people who are um, kind of financially comfortable do take part in the research, um, and this somewhat reflects the cost of people who, the cost of having um, fertility treatment. So it creates these um, sort of internal biases in the sample. Um, but in terms of opening up treatment, then I think even though then it might create slightly different financial circumstances of people coming towards treatment, uh, the research shows that people who think about having a single child alone go through such a lengthy thought process about it um, that they gather so much support and um, take it in a really extensive period to think about it that I still believe the children would be um, like well cared for and have um, extended networks of support, even if we did start to see some variation in terms of um, finances. Um, but more research is needed with more diverse samples, absolutely, to better understand this from an empirical perspective. Even those who are poor are not going to stay childless. They just find another way of getting pregnant. So they go on the internet. If you look at the data, the, the, it's amazing. The numbers there are staggering. So the point is that you, you take away the possibility to do it in a clean way, in a supportive way, and, but that has nothing to do with their finances. You're punishing them twice now. Once by pushing them somewhere where they don't want to be and avoiding them getting access because they don't have the finances. So we know, and that is I mean, that's clearly confirmed, poverty is one of the worst things you can get as a child. 
it, it harms you in so many different ways. But this is not about poverty. This is about access. So these poor women will just find another way, but they still will be poor. So you're just making them poorer if you make them pay for treatment. So as far as I'm concerned, they never win by the situation you create by not reimbursing. My name is Jackie Boivin. I'm a, a health psychologist from Cardiff University. So is the major stumbling block one of resources and a hanging on to resources and not wanting to pay for the NHS? Or is it still an issue of normative change around who should be a parent? So there's only some people who should be parents. And I guess your long list of criteria for single people would suggest there's um, a higher sort of obstacle, uh, more obstacles for single people. So are we just waiting for a big change in society or is it just getting the government to pay more for this kind of uh, access? The reality that I work in, and I'm sure many clinicians do, is that the NHS is not a bottomless money pit and governments are not bottomless money sources and therefore there is a reality checkpoint. If you want more people to be treated with the same resource, you have to spread it thinner. And that means people queue longer, wait longer, et cetera, et cetera. I am not averse at all to investing a lot of time and effort into getting the right people to come and be screened and donate eggs or sperm or whatever to provide that. But again, it's a limited resource because we are picky about who we select because they need to have a good ovarian reserve or they need to have good sperm. But I think the bottom line is there is only so much money in a healthcare system. And it's very difficult when somebody's having a heart attack or got a broken leg or lung cancer and whatever to say we want it all for the fertility clinic to help people have children. You know, there's always going to be this socio-economic argument about how you deal with resources and I don't know, beneficence and justice and all this kind of stuff. As a clinician of fertility clinic, bring it on. Give me every patient that wants a baby and I will try and help them if that's what they need and want. But I, I think that's an unrealistic thought process in, in the current fiscal climate that we're in or generally in a national health service climate that we're in. That's my only problem. But I, I would specifically say single people, you know, you've got a, a same-sex couple You've got one woman that you're treating at a time usually and they're having donor inseminations. What's the difference whether they've got a, a friend, partner, civil partner, anything with them or not? You know, from a clinical, clinical point of view, the treatment pathway is no different for a single woman versus a couple. Being single or in a couple is not a relevant criterion here. But for instance, you could use the one that I saw on Sarah's first slide. You could say someone who already has a uh, biological child should not get money first. So you could have a point system where you say, okay, those who already have a child should only get when we have too much money. And as long as there are people without a biological child, we're going to spend the money there. But then you have to justify what you're doing. It's not as if I'm saying you should spend uh, more IVF money on someone who already has 12 children. I would say uh, it seems like more than enough. So, but then it's up to me to say why I'm doing it, and that's what I'm trying to defend. Give me a good reason, not just one like, I'm single and you're in a couple, so tell me why that is relevant. So that, that is the point. But you will anyway, because there's no endless amount of money available, you will always have to make certain decisions. We do it for age, we do it for a number of other things. So, and it seems very justifiable to me. So it's not as if I do not want any criteria. I just want the criteria to be justified and not just something that I've made up because I feel that, whoa, that this, is, this is too much or this is, this is wrong. Uh, give me a good reason. And, and that's what I feel is lacking at the moment. And that bothers me <laughs> as, a, as an ethicist. There is an element, you talked about whether it's normative, I do think there's an element that this is slightly downstream of historical distinctions in law between single people and couples that have obviously now been eliminated in a, a, a formal sense, but then when it comes to resource allocation, like these, these images come back in in that stage. So, you know, when the, 
Human Fertilisation and Embryology Act was passed in 1990, there were more restrictive rules on the types of couples that could access treatment at that point, you know, in the legislation, not just in terms of funding. And I think, you know, if we go back further, there were distinctions made in law, you know, as recently as the middle of the 20th century about your legal status based on whether or not your parents were married. You know, this is, it's not stuff in the life cycle of our understanding of, of individual status is that long ago. So I think it makes sense that then when there's a sort of edge case of funding, these normative ideas come back in, even if it's subconsciously, even if none of this is conscious. So I do think there's an element of that. Stuart Lavery, I'm a gynaecologist in London working in the NHS, and we treat single women. Okay. But they have to prove that they're infertile. And... What does this mean ethically, Guido? Can you reassure us that saying you have to prove you're infertile therefore allows rational, compassionate, ethical allocation of resource? Or is it just that we think that heterosexual couples are more deserving of parenthood? Or is it just a great British fudge that we use to deal with a challenging situation? So my bottom line question is, should people have to prove that they're infertile before receiving funded care? Uh, my answer would be no. I don't think it makes much sense. Because I don't think if you look at the total activities that we are doing, we are not treating infertility. We are treating involuntary childlessness. And that's what we are doing. And so if you stick to the infertility issues, you, want, you, you make this into a medical thing. But what is medical about being infertile? By the way, this is the kind of discussion that people have in developing countries. So are you going to die? No. How long are you infertile? Till you die? Or just until you're going to menopause? So start looking at this as the burden of disease thing. And you will see that there's an awful lot of very difficult questions entering. So what we are trying to do is to make people realize a certain desire that they have in life. And according to me, that's the criterion. So, and then we can start looking, as I said, if you already have 10 children, you can say your desire probably is satisfied now. So let's now go and look at someone else. So, but th the idea of making this into a medical thing where you have to prove that there's something wrong automatically excludes a very large number of people. We, we had the discussion before. I can say as a lesbian that my partner is azospermic. So she's infertile and so she's <laughs> going to be treated. Now everyone realizes that this is kind of funny reasoning, but at the same time that is the kind of reason that you're looking for when you want to have this into a medical thing. Look at this as something broader. And of course, if you take the, 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 uh, the United Nations uh, definitions of uh, well-being and health, then you will see that everything falls under it. So it's just up to society to decide how we're going to look at it. But I think it's the wrong approach. You, you already exclude so many people for what? For what reason? What do you do with the unexplained infertility? What do you do with... You know, we have a way of talking ourselves out of it if we want to, and, and this is what we are doing most of the time. Thank you. My name is Joanna, I'm an embryologist, and I work for the NHS in Scotland. And I'm quite interested in the ethics in terms of equality and equity. And there are a lot of other societal barriers um, for that I can see for single people trying to access treatment. So are we really just offering treatment to people who can then afford to have a child. Um, as a solo parent, you're considering the cost of childcare, that you're going to have to bear the burden for as a single person rather than that distributing between two people. The impact on your career progression, that you may not be able to have those same choices because you are the primary caregiver. Um, I think there are other um, uh, groups that, that traditionally struggle to access healthcare, so people who come from poorer socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, um, individuals with disability. So actually, are we offering an equitable treatment if we open this up? If you're looking at surrogacy, it's the cost of surrogacy within the UK. Um, that individual needs to be able to afford those costs. So are we really talking about equitable access? 
or are we talking about creating a, a, a situation where it's only individuals who can afford to have a child? Are we really talking about equity of access, true equity? For all of us, the future is uncertain. For all of us, our finances are not necessarily certain. Tomorrow is a new day and things happen. People get hit by buses, people get divorced, relationships split up, people go separate directions. And I think, you know, if you sat at the age of, I don't know, mid-twenties and said, this is how my life is exactly going to go and I'm still going to be married to this lovely, gorgeous man with my 14 children or whatever it is, then most of us would not end up in that position 20 years down the line. So I think... It feels almost like that's quite an unfair question to ask. I think if, I, I think, Gida, you said something about, you know, people that come forward to, to be single parents have, have, a, have had a thought process and had thought about in quite a, a, a great amount of detail about how they're going to pay or be a parent or what support they have or, you know, whatever. And I don't think as a clinician it's my job to sit in front of somebody and work out whether they're fiscally responsible or whether they're going to be able to afford X, Y, and Z. Because I'm a clinician. It's not up to me to work out their life plan. And we certainly don't do it if they've got a husband or a wife with them. So, you know, on some level, I think you're setting too many inequities or too many potential barriers to, to somebody else's future. Ordinarily, when rationing decisions are made in healthcare, it, they're made on clinical grounds, you know, so if there's a range of treatments for a particular condition, there are cost-benefit analysis about whether you're using expensive or inexpensive ones. That's not what we're talking about here. So I think it creates a really interesting framework where the people making these decisions are still clinicians, but when they have to decide who should get access to fertility treatment, it's, it's a combination now of clinical considerations and non-clinical considerations. And I think actually, when you talk about the mess, I think that's part of the mess here, that like clinicians are essentially being asked to reckon with factors that are non-clinical in the, the distribution of treatment um, because of the, the resource position that we're in, which is nothing to do with the clinical determinations. Um, and I think that speaks to questions that are much, much wider than who should have access to fertility treatment. It speaks to questions about how our society is funded. If a, a 20 year old heterosexual male turned up wanting treatment on the NHS, what would you do? Would you, would you think it would be fair to treat them? If you would treat a heterosexual couple that are both 20, what are you going to tell them? Wait until you're 25, 28, because you're clearly not capable of making decisions. Sounds, sounds like a weird thing to say. So, but that's what they do with the single women. So for a single man, it would be the same. Why do you think the person is not competent? We decided, all of us together, that there are certain ages at which, unless you can prove me wrong, we assume that people are capable of making decisions. They can do so when they are naturally fertile, and so they can probably also do so when they have to go to a clinic. So. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see how you're going to justify a refusal unless, as I said, you can show that this person does not really know what he or she is doing. And that sounds like a good reason to say, uh, wait a bit, come back in a few years. But, but outright, why would the age be a relevant thing? Uh, we, we can vote at 18. Okay, and wrong too, but, <laughs> but so as far as I'm concerned, but, but by the way, just to make something clear about the uh, single men and single women, I think that surrogacy might be a relevant difference. So I'm not saying that they should be treated equally. So I think that if you have a problem with surrogacy, you should have it for everyone. So, but that implies, in one case, that the single man would not have access. But I think it would still be justifiable. So it's not as if I'm saying that it should all be the same. If you think there's a problem with surrogacy, then it is obviously more of a problem for single men than it is for single women. I'm not sure that I see the need for surrogacy as being so very different, because if you were a single woman with no uterus, or if you were a couple, and the female had no uterus, then surrogacy would be part of the fertility requirements. I think if you're going to treat somebody who is single, 
then whether they're 20 in male, whether they're 30 in male, whether they're 40 in male, God forbid if they're 70 in their male, you know, we don't have any eligibility criteria. And this welfare of the child form, which is extraordinarily difficult to really decline anybody treatment, I think in the entire time I've been a consultant, nearly 15 years, I've only signed one where I felt that we couldn't at that point in time at least progress fertility treatment. You know, I think if, if, if it's agreed that single people should be funded, then being 20 single male should be no different to being 25 single female, etc., etc. But I, it, I, I say that's through very gritted teeth. 